Today, you will unlock what's required to become a Solidity programmer. So let's get started. Apps that are built on blockchains are called smart contracts and they execute on the blockchain. So a programmer is responsible for creating some criteria by which the smart contract executes. Let's say you create an app that allows you to swap tokens on a blockchain. Once you deploy that code to the blockchain, anyone anywhere in the world can swap tokens in the app and the app can never be removed as long as that blockchain exists. People will often use the terms blockchain apps, dApps and smart contracts to define these apps but effectively they're describing the same thing. We'll start coding using something called Remix, which allows you to create smart contracts just using your web browser. You'll be able to easily test, write the smart contracts, and also deploy it to a blockchain. So at the end of this video, we will deploy the app that we created to the blockchain. So therefore you can see the whole process from start to end. When I say the blockchain, I mean a blockchain because there are many blockchains, but you know what I mean. So as we enter this world of Solidity programming, our first mission is to say hello to this new world. Before we start saying hello, I will show you how to navigate this world. So within Remix, we can see on the left hand side, we have some icons where you can explore files, search files, compile the files and deploy. So we're starting off in the file section, open the folder called contracts and create a new contract and name the file level one. In my case, I'm gonna say level one demo. We'll provide all the code required in a GitHub repository. So every Solidity file you specify will have the following layout. You're going to have the license identifier so that you can see whether or not the code is available to be open sourced. We're going to use the MIT license. Every file will start with a comment indicating its license and in Solidity to write a comment, we simply do double slash, then we write the comment. The next part of a Solidity file is we have to use a pragma keyword. This word enables certain compiler features or checks. It's a directive saying, which version of Solidity that you are going to use. When you compile your file, you also have to make sure that the version of your file is the same as the compiler. I am going to use version 0.8.18. So I type the line pragma solidity 0.8.18 followed by a semicolon. And then I can save this by either pressing command S if you're in a MacBook or hitting the compile button, which is a third item down on the left panel. The first thing we're going to do is declare our smart contracts. We're going to use the contract keyword and the name of the smart contract is going to be called level one. And now you declare the smart contract. Now create a variable for the smart contract. And this variable is going to contain the greeting that we will say to this world. So it's going to be a string, which is a type that allows you to store text. We are going to name the variable greeting is equal to hello world and you put it in quotes so it knows it's a string then you do compile and you see that compiles correctly but one thing that you have to do in solidity is specify the visibility of various elements within your smart contract so i would like this greeting to be public which means anyone can interact with this contract and see what this variable has stored in it i'm going to compile and let's just deploy this within remix we have a simulation of the ethereum blockchain which we can use to deploy our smart contract if you hit the forward button on the left we can click deploy and we can see that we have this and then if I hit greeting here, we see it says hello world. Let's say the visibility of this variable actually was something else. Other options are private, internal, and external. With private, no one will be able to see it outside of our smart contract. So if we save and then deploy it again, we can see that there is nothing we can interact with. We can't see the greeting variable. If we were to make it internal, what do you think is gonna happen? Well, let's deploy and see. We still can't see it. Internal can only be seen by the actual smart contract, which contains the variable or any other contracts that inherits it. And then finally, we have the opposite of internal, which is external, which means only contracts outside of the smart contract can see this variable. External cannot be used with variables, however, but it can be used with functions. Let's say we wanted to change the state of this variable so that anyone else can update it because they come from a different country or they have a different slang so they greet each other differently so that brings us to completing level one of interacting with solidity we are now going to move on to levels two to seven so i would like you to open a new file and call it level two.sol and write the following contents so we have the exact same thing we have the license the version of solidity and then we have the variable which is now private and it has the, the text hello world now for us to be able to update this variable we can create a function called update greeting and take in a new greeting which we can then update the contract state with because we've made this variable private now we'd like to create a function that is public that allows us to access this variable functions are small units of work that your app can perform so let's think of it like you had a web page you had a button which said update greeting or show greeting so we have the keyword function 
function, the function name, and then within these brackets here, we have the parameters of the function, which means whenever you do call this function, you have to pass some data to it. So the type of data we're going to pass is string, and the string name is going to be called new greeting. The function itself is a public function. You just have to learn the ordering here. And then we use open curly brackets, and we say that greeting is equal to new greeting. So the current greeting, which is hello world, is now going to be open to this new greeting. So we see something new here, which is called call data. When you are sending data to a function, it's useful to specify where that data should be stored. So in function signatures, you may see two keywords often, which is call data and memory. There's one other keyword called storage. When we use the call data location, it means that the input is read only. If we were to use memory, then we will copy that object into temporary memory, which will only exist while the function is being interacted with. And we normally use storage if it's a state variable. Let us compile and then we can deploy level two. So just make sure the contract is selected here in this contract section and normally is selected by default once you have compiled recently. Now we have level two, hello world, hello world. Wait, let's rename this so it makes more sense. Level two and compile. And now I'm just gonna deploy because I changed the name of the contract. All right, so level two. And we are going to update the greeting and we're gonna say hola. And then the transaction was successful and then show greeting hola. If you're from Trinidad, which is where I'm from, you'll type was the scene. And if you show the greeting, it'll say was the scene. If you're from London or Jamaica, you might type wagwan. And it will show the greeting Wagwan. If you're in France right now because you're at ETH Paris, which is this event that I'm not at and I wish I was at, then you'll type Salut and it will say Salut. Okay, that's all. So let's move on to level three. Now we're at a point where we realize, you know what, there might be many greetings. People might have so many slangs. Now we'll be able to create a mapping, which essentially allows you to store a lot of keys and values. So we could have keys like GM, the value will be the number of Kongs, which is the number of times a smart contract was updated to have that new greeting. So it'll be GM2, hello world, five, etc. The way that we do that is use a data structure called mapping. So you would write mapping and you would specify what the key and value types are. So the data types are string, and you end. If you'd like to learn more about data types, then definitely check out the documentation. But for now, we're just using these two data types. I'm going to make the visibility private and we're going to call it greeting counts. So within the update greeting method, I'm going to say that in the position where this new greeting is, if the value is equal to zero, and it's only going to be equal to zero if it's the first time we're updating it, then we're going to set it to one. Otherwise, we're going to increment, that's what the plus plus means, increment whatever is at that position. So if it's two, it's now three, etc. And then I created a new function, which is get greeting count, which is used to return the greeting count for a particular greeting. So as we can see here, we are saying that it's a public visibility, it's a view. The view keyword is also used to specify that we're only ever going to return data and then we have to say the type of data we're going to return, which is an int, and it's going to return the greeting counts at that position within the mapping. And you get the value by sending in the key. So if I were to save and then deploy level three, I can now update the greeting. I can say GM and I can get the greeting counts for GM. It says one. If I try the greeting Kong for Hello World, it says zero because we've not updated it with Hello World not. And we can also show the most recent greeting. So if I do was the scene, update greeting, the most recent, but we could still see that GM is within the mapping. Now I'm curious. So now we want to see which greeting is the most popular. That takes us to level four. Create a file and call it level four.sol. Now, the way how mappings work, in order to go through a mapping, you have to know the keys. And right now, the way we've done it, we don't know the keys. So we've created a new variable which allows us to store each key. So we'll know all of the keys and the keys in our case are the greetings that have been used in our small contracts. We're making it an array, which means it's going to have an index as a position. So position zero will be one value, position one will be another value, position two will be another, and the value itself will be the keys. So whenever we do create a new greeting, we have to then push that new greeting onto the greeting keys. And then we created a method which is called get greeting with most counts. And it's going to return a string, which is the greeting as well as the counts. First, we're checking to see whether or not the greeting keys is more than zero, because if not, there's no point to even try to continue with the call. And this is a way to handle exceptions within your code. So it's a good way to prevent your smart contract from doing too many steps and absorbing gas fees when there's no need to, because they didn't even satisfy the first criteria. And then we're going to create a string. We're just specifying the locations being memory. We would like to create two variables, which allow us to store the most popular greeting as well as 
the highest count. So by default, we'll just use the first greasing key and then we'll use the greasing kongs at that particular position. So you see, we're using the greasing keys array to figure out what's at that position for the first greasing. And then we're using our mapping to send in that value, which is the key, and then see what's the count of that position. So we're going to use a for loop, which allows us to iterate through the greasing keys, which is an array. So we're going to start at position one, because we already have position zero here, and array start at position zero, not one. And we're going to go up until the length and then iterate each time the loop goes over. And we're going to say the greeting is equal to greeting keys at position i, which will start off at one, then two, then three, depending on the length of the array. And then we're going to say that the count is equal to greeting counts, checking the mapping for that particular greeting. And if the count is greater than the highest count, at first it'll be the first object within the array, then store the highest count as that new count and also store the most popular greeting as that greeting. So if we compile, deploy level four, and then we start adding some greetings. So I'm gonna be like GM, hola, ni hao, GM, GM. And then now I'm going to say, get the greeting with the most counts, it'll say GM. So let's say if I do ni hao, and then I do ni hao, and then I do ni hao, I do ni hao, show greeting, get a greeting with the most counts, ni hao, and we have five counts. Now we are getting a ranking for all the greetings within our smart contract. We have three more levels to go. So create a new file, call it level five, that's all. And the point of level five is just to make the code from the previous section a little bit more efficient. In the same method where you're updating the greeting, you're also checking to see whether or not that greeting has received the most counts. So what we'll do is we'll keep the same greeting method, but we're just gonna simplify it a little bit. So we're gonna say that the count is equal to greeting counts at what that position plus one. So this works because even if it's the first time you're adding the greeting, it's going to be zero plus one. If it's not the first time, it'll be the current count amount plus one. And then we're gonna say that the greeting counts is equal to count. So now we know the count, right? And we're gonna say if the count of this particular greeting is more than the highest count, which we will be saving every time we run this, we will say highest count is equal to count. And then the most popular greeting is equal to new greeting. And then in this line, we're going to say if the count is equal, but the length of the new greeting is actually shorter than the length of the old greeting, less than the last greeting in our smart contract just for storage purposes. So then we're gonna update the most popular greeting. And that's it. The function will still work as you assume. So if you compile, and you deploy and you say GM, update between GM, the world GM. So if we check now, the greeting with the most counts will be GM. All right, so we're moving along to level six dust cell because we realize our smart contract is getting a little bit popular. Like we're getting updates. We're like, hey, 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 hey. Maybe we should monetize the smart contract. So the way that we're going to do that is every time someone wants to update with a new greeting because everybody wants their language to be first, they'll have to pay a small fee. So we are going to define this as a constant with an off smart contract and it's going to be a private variable and the update, actually let's make it public so everybody can see what the fee is actually. And then we're gonna say it's 0 0.001 ether. So $1.90 cents to update it. Let's make it a little bit cheaper. Let's make it 0 0.001. Then we are going to say, when you are interacting with this update greeting method, we are using this keyword, which is called payable, which indicates that this method expects to receive some dollar dollar bills, y'all. Do you have the money or not, bro? <laughs> and then we're going to use the require exception handler to say if the value of this message is not greater than, just in case you want to pay more or equal to, what we think our greeting fee is, we will revert the transaction real quick and say, actually, you do not have enough money to update the greeting. And that's it. Also, one thing we did is we created this event, which is called greeting updated. A method signifies something has happened. And if you would like to make it easier and also cheaper for your smart contract to read these events without storing it as a variable within your smart contract, then this is the best way to do it. So it's a way to have cheap logging within your blockchain ecosystem. We're going to use the sender of the transaction. The indexed keyword makes it easy for you to search this within the logs. So search the sender, the string, which is the new greeting and the amount paid. And then at the end of this method, we're going to emit this event with the message of sender. So this message variable holds information about the transaction and you can use that to get the address of the sender. We get the greeting and then we get the fee that they sent. And then actually it should be message.value just in case they decide to send more than the fee. So we are going to save this level six and then I'm going to deploy it. Now, when you are sending this transaction, you see it's even red. So you have to submit an amount. So let's say I say GM. And then here in the section of the environment window, you can select the value that you're going to send. Change the base unit to ether. 
in Ethereum or Ethereum like blockchains, there are actually no decimal points. So the smallest unit is called a we. One ether is actually equal to 10 to the power of 18 we. Then if you would like to send 0.001 ether, then it'll stop much we. So I can pass that here as a value. So when I send the transaction, I can then say update and it works. So the balance of the smart contract is now 0.001. Let's say I pass one zero less, which means it is too small for the payment. Place that value and I say, hi, update greeting. Transaction did work. So the transaction has been reverted to the initial state, the reason provided by smart contract, insufficient payment to update. Now that you're allowing the smart contract to store money, how are you gonna get the money out of the smart contract? Trust me, like do not forget this step because if you had a smart contract that was making money and you can't withdraw it, the smart contract is already deployed, you're in trouble. So that brings us to level seven. We are going to create a method and we're gonna call it withdraw funds. We are going to say that only someone outside of the contract can call it so that nobody tries to do something weird with the smart contract itself. And then we're going to pass an amount in, which is how much we'd like to withdraw. We need that amount to be less than what are the address of this smart contract's balance. Otherwise, you will say insufficient smart contract balance. We will transfer this to the owner and we just specify payable to say that the owner is receiving funds. What is the owner? We'll get back to that. And then we'll emit funds withdrawn. And again, emit is a way to do logging within the smart contract. So we created an event to match this. So now let's talk about only owner. We've now created a constructor. This constructor allows us to initialize variables when the smart contract is just being deployed. We've added a field in the smart contract, which is the owner, and then we're saying that the owner is equal to message.sender, which is the sender who sent the smart contract to initialize the smart contract. We're keeping it private for now because nobody needs to know who the owner is. And then within this method, we also have something called only owner. This is called a modifier. So modifiers are code that can be run before or after a function call. And it's used to do things like validate input and restrict access. It's really great for access control. And as we can see here, we have a modifier which is called only owner and it requires that the message or sender is equal to owner. So we could have easily put that line here in the smart contract, which is require message or sender is equal to the owner. But using a modifier is a very neat way of doing it because then if we have multiple methods that should have that particular modifier, it'll be easier for you to just copy it across your code. We will compile. Then we shall deploy. Then we shall update the greeting and we shall update the greeting by sending money into the smart contract because now we have to pay because the price went up. Then update. Perfect. I think there was an extra zero at the end when I pasted that. Now we're going to say, hey, I want to withdraw funds. I'm going to withdraw that amount and the withdrawal happened successfully. So let's say I switched to the address here and I try to withdraw funds. It says, uh-uh, only the contract owner can call this function. The final step is for us to deploy the smart contract to a testnet. I am assuming you have a MetaMask wallet. If I go to Polygon Faucet, this gives you test tokens for their test network. So there's a real network, as in like there are transactions running on it, but the value is not real. So I'm going to paste my wallet address here and then submit, confirm the transaction, and then they will send it to that address. I'm going to change from the VM and switch to injected MetaMask provider so that way it connects to your wallet. But to add the Polygon EVM, this link has the details to connect to the testnet and I'll share that with you. Click networks and then click add a network and then you'll click. So add a network manually, type Polygon ZK EVM's net, RPC URL, chain ID, I think is 1442, currency is ETH, and then the blockchain explorer URL is that. And then you do that, and then you say save. So now I'm connected to that testnet, and I will switch to that testnet. And when I go back to Remix and I go to injected provider, it will switch to that network, which is a testnet network. So now that I have that, I will deploy the level seven smart contract on the Polygon ZK EVM. This is deploying to the Polygon ZK EVM testnet. Now I'd like to update the greeting. So I do want to update it to GM. So 0 0.001, copy, and then paste. And then I am going to say transact. Awesome. If I want to get the greeting with the most ones, if I do transact again, if I try to transact without sending money in, the transaction will fail because of insufficient payment. If I try to withdraw some funds, or some of my money back, and if I try to switch this wallet to another one that's connected, if I try to withdraw funds, it will say only the contract 
one that can call this function. So we can see that it works. That brings me to the end of this video. You have completed the seven step series teaching you about Solidity. If you would like to learn more of the basics with Solidity, I really recommend this website called Solidity by example. I welcome you to comment and ask any questions. Thanks so much for watching and see you in the next one. Bye.